The typical definition of dynasty, and it's there's many definitions, of course, depending on degrees of consanguinity that you want to capture. But the the really basic definition is relatives uh, who are elected into office, right, and who span across time and across different positions. So there are two there are two vectors, right? Um, you may have relatives in different positions in a particular province. Um, but almost always the common element of defining dynasties is that over time you hold those positions, right? So what we've come to, to define in the study are two main types of dynasties. One is a thin, thinner type of dynasty where the positions are actually, I mean the, the family members are following each other over time. But they are not expanding into different positions. So, so imagine a congressman. Uh, si Lolo Congressman, Congressman siya nung 1960s. Pinalitan siya nung Congressman later on, 1970s or, or whatever, afterwards nung anak niya. Tapos nung apo, tapos nung apo nung, you know. Uh, so, that kind of a, of a thin dynasty pattern, uh, we think, used to be quite prevalent in, in the Philippines. And in fact, if you go to many provinces, many um, municipalities, maraming position na uh, Yung mayor nila has been that last name for so long, you know. Now, uh, I we think actually uh, another type of dynasty is the fatter type of dynasty, and the reason there's a lot of interest in this is because it seems that in recent years there's been an expansion of this fatness. One, by there are more dynasties seeking to be fat, and two, already fat dynasties are becoming even fatter. So there's two trends, right? Um, so so we think actually that more of the interest in terms of political dynasties in our democracy has been spurred by the fatness factor, not by the thinness factor. A fat dynasty is what kind of dynasty? Okay. The, the essential description is hindi lang sila nagsusunuran over time. Basically, across positions, they uh, simultaneously occupy these positions. Uh, if you think about it, why would we even care about a fat dynasty? So, a, fa a fat dynasty is basically magkakasabay sila. A, a thin dynasty is isa-isa lang, right? So, a fat dynasty actually, at least from, let's say, an economic point of view, a development economics point of view, a democracy is supposed to have strong checks and balances in the government infrastructure, right? Uh, this is one of the strengths of democracies, which is why countries even pursue to have a democracy in place. It's because you have that kind of a, of a feature built into it. Uh, the people who elect uh, uh, these leaders can replace them if they're not any good. Uh, and the leaders who are elected in this echelon of leaders that you have in a democracy can basically perform their duties and also act as a check and balance against each other, right? Now, with the fat dynasty pattern, there are potentially two failures. One is, nasa tao pa rin ba yung choice, yung kapangyarihan na palitan yung leader na leader nila sa probinsya or leader nila sa municipality. Kung fat yung dynasty, marami na siyang resources na hawak eh. And usually, um, there's a lot more power that they can basically apply to the particular jurisdiction that they're you know, that they ex exercise that power. Um, so you begin to wonder, where is the power residing? Is it still with the electorate? Or is it already with that, you know, dynasty that has entrenched itself? The second potential failure in terms of governance and the democracy is, well, kung uh, magkakamag-anak kayo, will you still exert the same checks and balances in the system? Kung nakita nung anak na mayor, yung tatay niya na governor, may ginagawang mali, Pagsasabihan ba niya yun? Right? So, it, it begs the question of whether... And then the, the other, other sets of issues is when you're allocating resources and six, you have six mayors and you're the governor, you're, you're about to allocate resources among the six mayors in your province and three of the mayors are your children and the other three are not. Right? Even if you were a right-thinking, um, you know, basically clean provincial governor, your choice of allocation will be subject to 
you know basically people questioning why did you allocate in that manner right because you put yourself in that position so so there are potential weaknesses on the checks and balances once you have those kinds of structures in place so are there certain provinces where you have a predominance of fat families in what would explain this you in your study you look at Maguindanao, Camarines, Sur, etc. Yeah. What are the highlights of the per province level? Okay, but, but before that, let me mention the first study that we did on the 15th Congress was supposed to basically just do a landscaping empirical description of the 15th Congress, um, looking at average uh, dynastic patterns and average poverty. So, so that's what we tried to do there. This second study is actually trying to understand what are the factors that potentially contribute to certain dynastic patterns, okay. including these fat dynasties, or okay. having more fat dynasties. Right. Yeah. So maybe to answer your question there is, well, we've seen uh, family names like Ampatuan, Fua, uh, Singson, uh, Ecleo. These are some of the fatter uh, dynasties in the data set and we are seeing some links between uh, the certain variables that we've studied and this pattern of having more fat dynasties for instance one one thing we're seeing right now in terms of the evidence is the more poverty you have the more fat dynasties you also tend to have okay. so our original study basically there was no causality that we could claim basically we, we found that if you have more congressmen that are dynastic, chances are mas marami ring mahirap dun sa mga distrito ninyo. Yun yung original study. This study, we're now through empirical methods in economics that we're trying to implement. Essentially, we have more comfort in saying na something seems to be having a causal effect on another variable. And in this case, we wanted to test whether poverty is impacting on these types of dynastic patterns. So we find initial uh, but strong uh, evidence that there is a positive link. More poverty, you have more fatter dynasties, okay. right? So that's that's one one set of uh, uh, links that we have. What is the chicken and egg relationship there? Did poverty engender the growth of fat dynasties, or fat dynasties led to greater poverty? Okay. We are still trying to uh, basically resolve that broader question. Uh, this is basically the initial results of an ongoing study. So there are two directions that we're trying to test. One is, does poverty cause dynasties? Or does dynasties cause more poverty, right? We've been able to test the first direction already. There seems to be strong positive evidence that you have more poverty, chances are you will have more fat dynasties. So you, you link, right? But we're still in the process of testing the other side. Basically for completeness and you know to satisfy academic rigor, we do need to test okay. the other side. But from this first results, mukhang malakas yung, yung link na poverty, you, it results in dynasties. The study shows that there are provinces that are, that have the, that are the most dynastic and with fatter dynasties. What are the top? provinces what are these ones okay is it, and then the, the thinnest dynasties the provinces with the thin dynasties are fewer okay uh, less dynastic okay just just to clarify okay. the ones with the fattest dynasties of course Ampatuan is in Maguindanao uh, Ecleo is in Dinagat Islands Fuwa is in Sikihor Singson is in Ilocosur um, I, I, I can't name off the top of my head all of them but these are the okay. examples of the fat dynasties uh, and I want to note that basically they're not all in the south because there's a, an ongoing hypothesis that uh, the fattest dynasties will tend to be in Mindanao. No, there are many fat dynasties in the north also and some dynasties that are becoming fatter even in urbanized areas like uh, uh, where we are right now. Um, so it's, it seems to be a pattern and it's cutting across different contexts. So it's not the, the fact that it's Mindanao that you have them, it seems. It's cutting across our entire democracy. Now the other point, you, you asked who are the thin dynasties. Uh, of course, they're harder to remember because they're thin. You know, it's just one person in, in power. There's a whole list of them. Um, but, uh, well, what, what, what I wanted to say there essentially is that they're still part of the data set. And they do, um, in, in certain areas, 
uh, for instance, you have both fat and thin. It's not just the fat dynasties. So they, they seem to coexist, along with, of course, the non-dynastic officials. Uh, Across the Philippines, there are 80 provinces. What is that picture? Do we have a dominant picture of provinces with more fat dynasties than provinces with thin or dynasties or less dynastic? Mm -hmm. Because they're saying that in your first study and other studies also that complement your first you have dynasties. Right. But is the dominant picture one of uh, more fat dynasties or more thin dynasties? Oh, okay. Um, it's a it's a little bit of a mixed picture depending on you know how fat is what you call fat um, of course if you have uh, upwards of 20 family members in office in the elected uh, positions that we studied I'd say that's fat um, however there are uh, some last names that we spotted in our data set that only have two family members, three family members, five family members in power, and they coexist with the fat ones, the really fat ones, you know, like with 20 family members in power. So, so they do exist out there, uh, and it's very difficult to generalize where the, you know, the 20s are and where the fives are. Um, I think actually what's more interesting and what's more uh, important for us to keep on studying uh, as, you know, we look at our democracy is what really are the incentives and what are the patterns for, let's say, you have a two or three member uh, dynasty in a particular uh, region. What prompts them to expand to become 20? That's right. Or, or, or even just one elected official who gets in, get, gets elected. Why make your wife run? Why make your cousin and, and other relatives run? Why, why even contemplate that kind of a, of a structure? I think if we start to answer those questions, we'll begin pointing at some of the weaknesses of our democracy, which is why we are not bringing in new faces, which is why we are not potentially bringing in more competent, more credible leaders, because there is a crowding out of some of these potential options. The ones who are in power with already some uh, leverage of power can actually use that power to expand and get more relatives into power. And then the ones who actually get into power, somehow they think that perhaps they will be able to function well if they have more relatives also helping out. So I guess that's how some of them have rationalized it. So what's in it really for the dynasties? Why do they have to grow fat? We were exploring earlier what could be uh, the, what, what are they invested in? What are they investing in? Mm -hmm. So why do they grow fat? Yeah. Well, of course, the, one of their answers that they will give you is that most of them are oriented towards public service. Okay. Is that correct? Uh, possibly. I, it's not my position to, mm -hmm. to question that. If that's what they say, that's what they say. Okay. But perhaps if you think about, let's say, economic incentives or even political incentives, there is a certain degree of power that you accumulate if you have many people who are on your side. That's right. And typically in a democracy, you will be on my side if we believe in the same thing. Let's say we believe in economic development and reducing poverty in this country to zero. Right. Let's say that's the belief that we share. I don't need for you to be my relative for me to support you if you believe in that same thing. That's right. I'll give you my vote, I'll contribute to your campaign, I'll help you out as much as I can. It seems that that is not the dynamic that is happening. Uh, and it seems, again, the, the saying uh, that is a cliché, that blood is thicker than water. In many places, uh, the party system is so weak that what they replace with the party system is a family-oriented system, where it's family members that actually are uh, invited into power or running, and also, I guess, for some of them, they're trying to rationalize it by saying that they're helping each other out to to govern that particular jurisdiction. And of course, even if you say this, even if they are the cleanest you know, leaders that we have, there is still uh, an awkwardness to it. There is still a potential risk to it. Because uh, of the checks and balances, because of the crowding out of other potentially good leaders, and because of the fact that maybe in a democracy, we shouldn't need relatives to support a certain you know, position or party line. The strength of an idea the strength of a conviction should be enough. And in a strong democracy, in a healthy democracy, that's really what should bind us. Not family relationship, 
it's what should bind us is the belief that we are all in this together and we are developing a country and of course that seems to be the weakness okay. so uh, what about uh, what should people take away from the study are dynasties good or bad because you hear some of the politicians saying we're a dynasty of public service when people already know us and we deliver results so what is it about dynasties exactly that we should think about as voters when we say we like it we don't like it because of what reasons exactly okay i'll give you the economic perspective on this and then i'll give you my personal perspective on this the economic perspective on this is checks and balances strong governance we should care about this because checks and balances and strong governance is potentially at risk with this kind of a pattern and again i say this and i even concede that maybe some of them are quite benign let's say that they are not corrupt let's say that they are quite benign and good leaders let's say that they have really good skills still it should make us slightly uncomfortable or maybe even more uncomfortable the fact that we need that kind of a structure in our leadership for our democracy and governance to function because if your relatives then checks and balances is it still there right my own personal view of of the dynasty study is it's just um, one of the aspects of a bigger challenge that we need to face which is our democracy does not seem to be very healthy and fortunately or unfortunately dynasties evoke a lot of emotion and interest among media academics our people so it's an it's an anchor i think to a bigger discussion that we should have and that discussion is how do we build a more inclusive democratic system one which gives young leaders a shot at leading our country one which gives uh, merit and good ideas the priority in terms of uh, governance right in terms of getting elected as leaders one in which you build stronger checks and balances right into the system one in which there is no patronage that we tax paying citizens help other citizens out yeah. not a local patron that poor people have to run to right so there's really a whole bunch of <laughs> issues that we we are after here dynasties is just a convenient first anchor for us but i think there are many other things that we need to look at